Great, man. A third fight of the year. You're just moving right up there in the ranks, fighting a guy who's been a perennial contender in this division for like half a decade or something at this point. Um, would you say your UFC career is going about as perfect as it could, mm -hmm. you know, given what you've, how long you've been around for so far? Uh, yeah, I'm, this is kind of how I imagined it. Um, I've been in really good gyms for the entire time that I've been training, so I knew that I, I knew where my skills lied, and it was just a matter of uh, time and momentum and, and all the stars lining up for me to for me to be where I am right now. Definitely. And coming off the last one, I mean, a lot of people consider Lineker one of the most dangerous guys in this division, all that kind of stuff to beat him uh, the way you did and just kind of get that win on your record. What does that do for your confidence, your momentum, all those things? Um, I would say the, the, the most fights that I get nervous for are the ones with the, that have the most danger in them. So, um, but those ones I, I also perform the best in. So um, me fighting Lineker was really big one because uh, anytime you're fighting a dangerous opponent you have to kind of face uh, those little voices in your head a little bit more uh, just because the danger and the risk is a lot higher um, but yeah I mean I, after getting that one I, I, I like I embrace that you know and I really like it so um, it was good you know I faced it uh, I performed really well uh, about near my, my capabilities I would say so um, yeah that was one I was really proud of yeah, and you're seemingly going to be the last one to ever beat him in the UFC. Were you surprised to see him leave from the organization after that? Yeah, I'm kind of bummed because I'm a Lineker fan, and uh, I don't really watch too much of the one stuff. So, I mean, I was bummed about it, but I, I don't know what went on behind the scenes for that to happen. But uh, I, I, I hope the best for him. Yeah, does that, does that hurt the Bantam in your division, in your opinion? I mean, he hadn't got to that title show yet, but he's a guy that, for guys like yourself that are coming up, uh, even established contenders, he's someone that you can fight, and you kind of find out how good guys are. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it hurts the division too much. I think that there's a lot of up-and-coming guys also that um, if the UFC plays their cards right and invests in the right guys, then, uh, I mean, they could have some really big superstars in the near future, myself included, I hope. But um, I, I don't think it's too much of a detriment to the division, but I, I am kind of bummed to watch him leave. Yeah, and coming off that win, I mean, you got Sun Sun. Was that the matchup you were hoping for? Was there any you know talks about other fights, or is this the one that you thought was you know kind of the perfect step up from what you just did? Uh, I think it is a perfect step up from what just happened. He's a much different fighter. He doesn't bring the same type of danger that Lineker brings, but uh, he is very well rounded, and you have to be prepared to fight in every single place during the fight. Um, but I don't, I don't play any part in me matchmaking. That's all my coaches. That's all my managers. Um, I, my job is to show up and fight on fight day and to prepare the best that I can. And uh, that's all that I put my focus on. Whoever they want me to fight, I'll fight. But it's, it's my coach's decisions as far as that goes. And um, I know Marlon looked very impressive when he beat him earlier this year, but generally speaking, you know, even if you win, a Sun is not the easiest guy to look good against. How do you prepare for someone like that who, you know, even though you go out there and fight one of your best fights, it may not you know, look the shiniest or anything like that? Yeah, so I think when you get to the level of maybe the top 10 or the top 5, you start to discover that the margins of you being better or worse in the certain areas of fighting, um, the margins aren't going to be crazy big, right? But uh, I can really maximize my advantages in this fight, and I bring a lot of advantages to the bantamweight division, me being as tall as I am, me having really good footwork, and me being as fast as I am. Um, that's what's going to take me all the way, you know? Um, just me being able to maximize all of those advantages and me bring in a lot of tools that they're not going to be used to, and them having to figure me out in 15 minutes is going to be very, very tough, and um, it's, it's a huge advantage for me. Yeah, and if you win this fight, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of room between you and the very top of the division. Um, I'm sure you feel that way as well. What do you see as like the one step between probably this win and the title? Um, I, I mean, I keep saying, man, whenever the UFC wants to give me the title, I'll take it. Uh, but I know that it's a business and it's run like a business, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, when it comes down to it, I think the UFC needs to invest in some newer guys. A lot of the, the other guys, I think, are maybe three, four years away from being done. And I still have 10 more years if I could play my cards right. So, um, I mean, I would like to see an interim belt between either me, Sterling, or Jan. Um, just being that we're the three new faces in the division that are performing very, very well. Uh, and then when Cejudo gets back to fighting at 135, if he's going down to 25 or whatever he's doing, he comes up to 135 and, and fights the, the winner of that interim belt. Yeah, and you mentioned, I agree, you know, you, Sterling Young, they're the guys who are kind of on the run, you know, beating the top level at this point. But Henry's talking about Frankie Edgar, Uri Faber and stuff. Is that disheartening as a guy who's kind of on the come up and you see him calling out guys who are, you know, kind of, like you said, the older guard of the sport right now? Um, 
I don't know how much influence that's actually taking, but yeah, man, I mean, like that kind of sucks, you know, uh, I don't like the day and age of uh, just putting on money fights. You know, I don't think that that's what's going to grow the sport as much. Um, it might make a quick buck for that night, but in the long run, I think that we need to invest in these younger guys like me, Sterling and Jan, who are going to be around for a while um, and, and who have real potential to, to really blow the sport up and to be the big name in, in, the, in the 135 division. So um, that's what I would like for myself. Um, but I, I understand that the money fights are kind of big now. And I mean, me obviously coming in, being new, uh, not the most exciting news to hear. Right. And what do you make of Henry Cejudo's kind of gimmick, if you want to call it that? He's calling out Valentina Shevchenko. He's calling out Edgar uh, Faber, all those people. What do you just, when you're kind of sitting on the side and observing this from the outside, what do you think about it all? I mean, he knows what it is. He's the king of cringe, man. And like, he's, he's very cringy. So, uh, um, I mean, he's playing his character. Uh, I don't know if it's real or not, um, but the dude is super cringy for sure. <laughs> Just back to yourself. I mean, uh, you mentioned how this could be you know, a challenging fight for you, but what's kind of the ideal way you see it playing out? Um, do you see it being you know, one of those tightly contested fights like Lineker or maybe you know, the finishes that you had prior to that? It's going to be a technical fight. Um, just outwork and outclass, and that's all I have in my head. M maximize my advantages, outwork and outclass him.